welcome everyone to the Rogers TV London 2021 federal election debate. This debate is for the Elgin Middlesex London riding. There are six confirmed candidates, Afiz, Afiz Ajibowu for the Liberal Party, Caitlin Cody, the New Democratic Party candidate, Chelsea Hillier, the People's Party candidate, Michael Hopkins, Christian Heritage Party candidate, Amanda Stark, representing the Green Party of Canada, and Karen Vecchio, representing the Conservative Party of Canada. I'm your moderator, Brona Morgan. You may recall I've been a candidate for the Green Party in past elections, but today I'm representing Rogers TV, and we are committed to bringing you a fair and unbiased debate to help our viewers make informed choices in the September 20th federal election. The questions I'll be asking the candidates today were developed with the help of local residents and who engaged with us on our social media channels. They were all vetted for content by the staff of Rogers TV and to ensure that they're all fair and unbiased. Thank you to everybody who responded to our call for questions. We hope you get the answers you're looking for today. The candidates attending our debate today are Afiz, Afiz Ajibowu, Amanda Stark, and Karen Vecchio. Caitlin Cody was unavailable due to attend due to a work commitment. Chelsea Hillier was a last minute cancellation. And Michael Hopkins is not present based on a policy of our host venue requiring disclosure of fully vaccinated status. All of, three, all of these three candidates have been afforded an opportunity to provide a recorded statement that will air following this broadcast if they're available by the broadcast date. The format for our debate is as follows. Each candidate will be afforded one minute for an opening statement, one minute for a closing statement, and one minute to respond to each question. If a rebuttal is warranted at the discretion of the moderator, 30 seconds will be allotted for that. Prior to the debate, numbers were drawn to, in order to determine the seating and the order of the opening statements. We'll progress through that order as we ask your questions for the next hour, giving all of our candidates an opportunity to answer first, second, and third. You'll understand it as it happens. We'll go in reverse order for the numbers drawn for our candidates' closing statements. So with all of those housekeeping matters finished, let's get started. For the Liberal Party, Afij Ajibowu is going to be giving the first statement. Thank you so much, Bruna. Hi, my name is Afiz, and I, I came to this lovely country uh, about eight years ago. Uh, I'm originally from Nigeria, uh, and, and I do cherish and uh, you know, understand what that heritage uh, means in, in coming to a fresh country. And that, I think, uh, gave me the, the necessary push to want to give back almost immediately. Uh, as soon as I landed there. Of course, I came here wanting to give my three lovely daughters uh, the opportunity to thrive. Uh, two of them are already doing very well. The, the last one uh, is in high school. Uh, so for me, this is just a continuation of what I've done since I landed in this country uh, about eight years ago, which is service and giving back to this community. And, and I'll continue to do that you know, as long as I live. Thank you. Thanks so much. Next, we're gonna hear from Karen Vecchio, who represents the Conservative Party. Hi, I'm Karen Vecchio, and I'm the Conservative candidate for Elgin Middlesex London. I was proud to be elected in both 2015 and re-elected in 2019. And in 2021, I am asking for your support in this election. This is a very important election for Canadians. This is a chance to secure Canada's future. With Aaron O'Toole as our leader, we have five key ways that we focus on doing that. First of all, we recognize that we need to secure jobs. We need to secure accountability. We need to secure mental health. We need to secure, oh, sorry, sorry, we need to secure our economy, and we also need to incure, secure the country. We need to ensure that as we're moving forward, we have a plan. And together with Aaron O'Toole, the Conservative Party has a plan. It is a plan for all Canadians to get us back on track and to we come forward from what has happened in the last 18 months following COVID. I thank you for everybody for your support, and I look forward to Election Day. Thanks for that statement. And finally, we'll hear opening statement from Amanda Stark, who's representing the Green Party of Canada. Hi, I am Amanda Stark, and I am local to Elgin, Middlesex, London, almost my entire life. 
grew up in Dorchester, living in St. Thomas now, and spent about a decade uh, living in London, doing business in this riding part of London. Um, and I have lived experience with hidden disability. My platform and campaign are focused on supporting and preserving local, whether it be natural resources or small businesses and agriculture. With a green lens, we believe in na nature conservation, ethical and ecologically sound practices for business, building cities, connecting infrastructure, and supporting local farming and small to medium sized industries. I don't have ties to corporate funding or conflicts of interest. I'm not a politician, I'm an advocate. Our position sets itself apart from others due to our priorities. First and foremost, the party has the most ambitious climate goals to, and a plan to meet them. We prioritize need for electoral reform, in implementing guaranteed livable income. Thank you. Thank you, candidates. Thank you, Amanda, and thank you, all candidates. Now we're going to progress to the question part of the debate. The first question is, what are you personally and your party as a whole going to do to bring civility back to Parliament? Ensuring that direct questions get direct answers, not sarcasm, not sound bites, and not whataboutisms. And people, particularly young people, see actual leadership when they watch question period. For this, we're going to start with Karen Vecchio, Conservative Party candidate. Thanks very much, and that is an excellent question because as we've seen in this 2021 election and, and as we have seen uh, democracies change, we have seen a lot, of bit of, uh, a lot of uncivilized behavior. I believe in connecting with constituents. I believe in an open door policy when people have issues that they can come to me and discuss. This is something that I have always afforded the constituents of Elf Middlesex and London as elected in 2015, providing the customer service and the supports that are necessary. I believe in leadership and I will continue to drive that leadership with a positive attitude. Thank you very much. Thanks for that response, Karen. Next, we will ask that same question of Amanda Stark for the Green Party. So uh, I'm running on a platform based on relationships and connecting with community. So that is my primary priority. Um, I'm not a politician, I'm an advocate, that's my saying. Uh, so I am here to listen and I'm here to lend my voice to those issues that are uh, the priority concerns for my constituents. And um, I don't run with a party that has isms and uh, standard phrasing although we do have a values-based platform and that's what I'm going to bring to the forefront here as well as listening to the needs of our people and speaking on their behalf. Thank you. Thanks, Amanda. And finally, Afiz Ajibou for the Liberal Party. Thank you so much, Brennan. I, I joined the Liberal Party for one very simple reason. That's the only party that aligns with my own values of respect for human dignity, irrespective of where you're from, what you sound like, whether you have an accent or not, your color, your sexual orientation, or how you want to be addressed as a human being, or even your religion. So for me, I think if every human being, irrespective of where you stand for, or your politics, can put that at the beginning and at the end of every conversation, I think what we've seen, particularly over the last couple of weeks, where people turn up, you know, stoning, you know, the prime minister, I think wouldn't be happening in this democracy. I mean, we are fortunate to have a beautiful country, and for me, that opportunity presents, you know, presents just one golden chance to be a credible person and to represent this riding credibly in the parliament. Thank you. Thanks, Afiz, and great answers, everybody. Appreciate that. Our next que question came from Facebook. July 2021 earned the title of the hottest month in recorded history. How will your party ensure a future for all Canadians in response to human-created climate change acceleration? We will go first to Amanda Stark with the Green Party. Hmm, great question. Uh, we have a, a very robust and ambitious climate plan. Uh, our, our plan will include not only uh, ways of addressing actual uh, the climate emergency um, and the, the plan for the communities dealing with the repercussions of the weather changes. But more than that, we're going to talk about guaranteed income. We're going to talk about the people involved during this time. We're going to talk about the Canada Health Act, 
Act. Um, we're going to guarantee the bailouts of carbon intensive sectors are both responsible and conditional. We need to hold our corporations accountable and we need to stop our investments in uh, these natural resources like oil and gas and we need to switch to something more sustainable. Thank you. Thanks, Amanda. Now, same question, Afiz Ajbo from the Liberal Party. Thank you very much uh, for that question. So if you check carefully on the uh, website of my party, you will see very clear f platforms. And one of them, obviously, you know, is the environment. And that's it, uh, particularly for someone like me who has a science background. I do, I do have a very strong science background. So, and I believe that we do need to strongly uh, respond to the climate emergency that we have. So on that platform, just taking it back to your question, on that platform, we do have five clear touch points. And uh, one of them obviously is creating jobs in communities around green uh, you know, technologies across the country. And that's very clear and it will be supported by funding and, and investments in, in clearly identified sectors. The other one obviously is importing pollution uh, in heavy industries uh, uh, between uh, 2050 so that we can achieve that net zero emission that you will see that we've talked about clearly over the last uh, couple of years. And obviously in handing plastic waste by 2030. Thank you. Awesome. And finally, Karen Vecchio for the Conservative Party. Thanks very much. And, and this is an, a question that's important to so many Canadians when we talk about the environment, when we talk about climate change. And we need to make sure that we have realistic goals that are also obtainable. We have indicated that we will hit the emissions targets by 2030 that have already been set out. We will also ensure that people, when it comes to the economy, ensuring that things like a border tariff are put on items that are coming from countries that do not have the same standards that we have when it comes to carbon emissions. We will look at the personal savings account and, in, and in put forward a personal savings account where any of the carbon, any of the dollars that you've put into carbon can put aside so that you can now invest into greener solutions. And we will also work on research and development to ensure that when it comes to helping with areas that have flood mitigation, that we will be there and be at the table. There is lots of that things that we need to do, including a national green energy strategy and, and ensuring that we can work with our industries, work with the people of Canada to ensure that we have a greener and brighter future. Thank you. Thank you again for those great answers. Now we have a question that came from our Instagram account. There should be no surprise that access to reliable broadband internet is a top priority, but access to affordable broadband internet must also be a priority. How will you commit to everyone in your riding having access to both reliable and affordable internet? Will you support establishing a new national target for digital affordability that reflects diverse economic realities? We will go first with that question to Afiz Ajibowu from the Liberal Party. Thank you very much. Uh, so also for me, who has uh, a very strong uh, tech background, incidentally, I currently see uh, work in tech, and, and I did work in the telecom industries uh, previously. So I do understand that the relationship between the regulators and the operators, particularly the GSM operators, have to be unbundled. I know this is very controversial to say in Canada, but that relationship has to be closely looked into, has to be unbundled, uh, so that pricing and, and competition in the industry can be thrown open. So for me, I think that is, that's an uncomfortable truth that, that nobody wants to talk to. So if you do elect me uh, in this election, if you do give me your confidence and your vote in this riding, that is one truth I'm going to be speaking to in the parliament, on bundling relationship between the, the regulatory bodies and, and, you know, and the, the major operators, and obviously diversifying these markets and, and enabling competition to thrive. I mean, it's a, it should be a market, totally market-driven uh, sector. And I don't think we see that clearly. That's very controversial, like I said. We don't see that in Canada, you know, at this point. Thanks a lot for that answer. Okay, Karen Vecchio for the Conservative Party. Same question. Thanks very much. And I, I'm sure, Afiz, I, I do believe that Afiz brings a lot to the conversation here because I believe with your background, there's a lot that we can learn from. But we know one of the greatest challenges that we have in Elgin Middlesex London is the connectivity. The fact that when you go from one side of the county of Elgin to the other side, so going from east to west and then going up to the north part of Thorndale and our north, most northern part, that we do not have reliable internet. In March 2020, when we saw students going online and well, we 
saw parliamentarians and businesses all going online, we know the drain that was on our system. And we know that students, businesses, and everybody could not connect to the internet at a time where it was so vital. We will ensure that by 2025, that all Canadians are connected. That is something that we must continue to do. We also must put in research and development. We also must work with all levels. We need to ensure that the big broadcasters, the big telecommunications companies are not suffocating those smaller, those smaller opportunities that we can make uh, plans with and make infrastructure adjustments within our commu own communities like they're doing throughout Elgin Middlesex London. Thanks very much. Thanks, Karen. And finally, same question, Amanda Stark. I was the teenager who grew up with no internet. We still had dial up while everybody else had cable. So um, this is definitely a priority for myself and for uh, my family who are in that, this riding and currently uh, experiencing these things. The pandemic has shown us that internet accessibility is a necessity. However, if people can't afford the costs associated, then it isn't accessible to them. There are a few different paths getting, uh, for getting more affordable internet. So whether that's establishing targets for affordability following Saskatchewan's model of a public utility. Uh, despite uh, largely rural, Saskatchewan has the lo lowest internet cost in Canada. So for my parents in Dorchester, my friends in Sparta, and everyone else in rural corners, I commit to improving the accessibility, both availability and cost, of broadband, in broadband internet to rural areas. Thanks, great answers again, candidates, and very civil debate so far, I love it. <laughs> We'll see how it goes after this one. We have two questions, but they're bringing um, opposing viewpoints on a really contentious issue. So they both came in through our Facebook comments. The first question, for all campaigns, and I'm a bit disappointed, the questioner says, why have you not insisted on all campaign workers and volunteers to be double vaxxed and committed publicly to it? You're gonna have to lead this country out of the pandemic and you cannot even set the example yourselves. Surely public safety should come ahead of politics. From the other side, ask the candidates if they will get rid of all vaccine mandates. They are a gross violation of our civil rights. Tell them there's a significant number of people who are basing their vote on this point almost exclusively. So two tough questions, two opposing viewpoints. We're gonna start with Karen Vecchio of the Conservative Party. Thanks very much, and I'm hoping we get two minutes for these questions with the two <laughs> questions. But, you know, that's probably what each and every candidate has probably talked about mostly at the doors. What is the vaccine mandates? What is your party going to be doing? As a Conservative, we have always talked about voluntary vaccines, recognizing that not all Canadians can have vaccines and that there also is hesitancy. I am proud to be a person who has been double vaccinated, and I have done my research to ensure that I'm making the right choice for me and the right choice for my family and my community, making sure that I'm there. We talk about these types of things all the time, but when I look at what I can do, I even just look at my own campaign. I have done a contactless campaign to ensure that the people in my riding are safe. I recognize that in one, country, uh, one part of my community, in the, town, or in the town of Elmer, there's approximately 50% who are vaccinated. Down the road, 20 minutes later, approximately 90% in Port Stanley are vaccinated. We have a very large and very diverse view on these things. We need to be at the table to come up with true, a true path forward. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Same tricky questions for Amanda Stark. It's so funny. I sit here flipping through my notes. I'm sure I had something on this. But ultimately, it comes down to having conversations, like Karen said. And I'm really glad that I'm joined here on the stage with people who are willing to have these conversations, because there are people with legitimate concerns, as you hear on one side of this debate. On the other side, you have other legitimate concerns. Both concerns are legitimate. And I do think it's important to acknowledge both sides, but also to look to the science, to have an established set. I am double vaccinated. My husband, family, parents, all double vaccinated. We believe in the vaccinations. And in terms of mandates, that's where we need to be having conversations. Because I do think that overall, it is important to make sure that there is a certain percentage. But for those others, we need to have choices as well. And this is a free country and we need to stay free. Thanks a lot. And finally, Afiz Ajibowu, Liberal Party candidate. Oh, thank you very much. I dropped my daughter off in school this morning. Uh, she's in high school. And uh, we were having this very small you know, talk on the way to school. And we we're trying to connect uh, vaccination and, and the ability to open back up straight off and schools getting back. And it's easy to forget where we were 18 months ago. We had practically the whole world shut down. Airlines, travel, businesses, all shut down. We have where we are today 
basically because, you know, the Liberal government rolled out the strongest response to the pandemic uh, that you will see in any developed country uh, globally. And, and for us, it's clear. What, what we need to do is finish that fight against uh, COVID, uh, you know, out of this election. And that includes mandatory vaccines uh, on planes, on trains, and, in, and on federal public uh, properties. I think we'll also be supporting clearly uh, proof of uh, vaccines. Uh, we're not ambiguous in any way. Uh, that, that will be required. Uh, we, we are all doubly vac I mean, vaccinated in our party before you do anything or go into any event. And we do require proof that we've done that. Thank you. Karen, are you requesting a rebuttal? Uh, all right, so 30 seconds to Karen Vecchio from the Conservative Party. I'll extend the same courtesy yeah. to the other candidates. And I, I thank you very much. And I think part of the problem is we've been in this for 18 months and we have to look at the fact that the immediate response to this recovery was not quick. So what we saw was a lot of people becoming confused frustrated. One day we're told to wear a mask, the next day we're not. So I think the biggest issue that we had was clear communication coming from the federal government at that time. And that is one of the things that I think I believe has landed us to the unknowns. How can we have these conversations when people are saying, well, I looked at that science from two weeks ago and this is what it's saying today. So although I, I really appreciate the work that was done by the government, it could have been done better. Thank you. And Afiz, would you like to rebut that rebuttal or Amanda? Absolutely. I, I, mean, I mean, I do appreciate you, you know, your point around communication and being open and clear about, but this is something that, you know, you haven't seen in over 100 years. And, you know, we, we were all learning and, and just winging this as, you know, as the days were running by between 2020 February, when the whole world uh, shut down, and a few months back when we had a confidence to open the country back up fully. So I think we've done fairly, you know, com compared to some other countries, I think we've done very well in Canada and we should appreciate what we have. And for us, I thank you. Thanks very much for those lively responses to that question. Um, all right, so following up a little bit about communications, we talk a lot about our senior population, especially over the last couple of years in terms of how we've responded to COVID to protect our most vulnerable. But we don't talk to them very often. When you are having conversations with our senior population, what are they saying about the COVID response? How do they think it's been? How do, where do they see us going over the next few months in terms of our continued response to COVID and our recovery? I think this question goes first to Amanda, if I'm correct. Amanda Stark from the Green Party. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's interesting. I've, I've been working with seniors for several years, and uh, they're very open about their thoughts on things. And so one of the things, they are very in, in, uh, in favor of vaccines. Uh, the, most of the seniors that I've spoken with have been um, committed to the vaccine mandate. Um, the one concern is their expense. At some point, if there is an expense that occurred, um, I wouldn't, they wouldn't want that, sorry. Um, and as far as the, um, the choices itself, I think they're just, they're just concerned that they still have a choice. Some are hesitant because of their maybe unknowns, the vaccines. And so I think, um, as I said earlier, just honoring both sides of that discussion and, uh, and providing education where possible. Thank you. Thanks, Amanda. Okay, Afiz Ajibo for the Liberal Party. Thank you. I, I think one thing we, we've left uh, too much on the table uh, dealing with this pandemic obviously has been the mental health, uh, you know, challenges and, and uh, products or from, and, and that's affected virtually everyone from the elderly to, to the young people. And I've knocked a lot of doors, uh, particularly in St. Thomas. And you see, unfortunately, we have also so many elderly people living alone. And, and you see that anxiety and, and, and the concerns around mental health from being alone for so long uh, some of them haven't had any human contact for over a year and the opportunity to actually talk to someone at the door I think for them was something they cherished and wouldn't forget in a long time. So I think uh, for, for me uh, What I've seen is that they strongly support the mandates uh, Most of them have been fully vaccinated uh, with the exception of a couple that I met. They were not totally uh, senior uh, that age, but uh, For me, I think we've done we've done fairly fairly well in treating seniors uh, through this pandemic. Thank you. And Karen Vecchio for the Conservative Party. Thanks very much. And, and through this pandemic, I think I've heard uh, similar things from many seniors. 
Isolation and mental health absolutely was one of the issues that we were dealing with in the last 18 months. Seniors who aren't able to get out of their home and, and difficulties getting groceries. And now going off and ensuring that others are vaccinated, making sure the spaces that they're going into are safe. Uh, I've spoken to the St. Thomas Senior Centre. That is one of those things. What do we do when one person is vaccinated and another person is not? So working within those circles to make sure we have those conversations. But I think the one, number one thing I'm hearing right now is about the cost of living. There has been a substantial increase of cost of living whether it's housing, whether it's food, whether it's gasoline, these things that people are planning on, on using their pensions for, well, the pensions are not matching what the cost of living has indexed to. And so we have to be very, very aware of that. Just recently, back in the second week of August, the Liberal government sent out a $500 check to seniors over the age of 75, forgetting about the low-income seniors between 65 and 75, and instead making an untargeted universal uh, payment. Thank you. And if there's no desire for a rebuttal, then we'll move on to our next question. Rural homelessness and access to services can look very different than in urban areas. How do you believe these issues should be tackled in Elgin, Middlesex, London? We will start with Afiz Ajibowu, Liberal Party. Thank you. Uh, you would agree with me that across Southwest in Ontario particularly, we haven't had a fair share of uh, you know, the, the attention of the federal government totally. And, and it's not by accident, it's basically because we don't have that might and representation that comes with belonging to the, uh, you know, the ruling party in, in the Elgin Middlesex. So we've had 16 years of the conservatives in this riding. And it's clearly, it's clear that we don't have that representation that will enable that might and the funding that would help things like rural transit and opening up our hinterlands. Uh, in the last, uh, particularly in the last six, seven years. So for me, what I'm bringing to the table is the opportunity to then represent properly in the parliament and then bring that federal might and the attention that we do deserve. We haven't invested strongly in this, uh, in this area, particularly in rural transit. Uh, you know, the Waterloo region, for instance, got all that federal money. Uh, Hamilton got all that federal money. We haven't had all that uh, in this riding. So I, I think the time is right now for us to vote Liberal and get moving in Elgin Middlesex, London. Thank you. Thanks, Afiz. Now Karen Vecchio has a chance to uh, respond to that question and probably rebut a little bit. It's all, it's all good. You know, people can believe what they wish. And I think the one thing that I know is working with our communities and our community partners is what infrastructure and building and making sure that we have municipal transit available. That has to be part of it because when we're looking at homelessness and we're looking at what we can do, how do you connect these things? It is a very complex issue. I'm really excited about the work that's being done in West Elgin where they have put up and will be opening up their own little space for the helping those people in need. I love what they're doing in Elmer where they have the central hotel where they're, they're helping those people in need. And in out of the cold that is open 24 seven. It is unfortunate, or 24, I'm sorry, 365 days a year. It is extremely unfortunate that we need this, but coming together and making sure that we're working with municipalities to help those who are most vulnerable is what we need to do here. And I've always been at that table and will continue to be at that table with our municipal and provincial partners. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. And Amanda Stark for the Green Party. Building strong communities involves including and advocating for our most vulnerable. You may have heard recently that all party leaders have announced plans to deal with the housing crisis. You may, have also, you may also notice that all announcements were made in large urban centers. My role, if elected, would be to ensure that our remote and smaller communities would not be left out. As such, I commit to advocate on behalf of small communities that they not be left out of funding, just as I did when canvassing Dorchester as a youth, gathering food for the food bank, or as a young adult collecting socks for the homeless in London. This issue is another that is at the top of my list. I would definitely support doubling the Reaching Home program for rural and remote streams. And one of our biggest party platforms is our guaranteed livable income, which would address this very important point. Awesome. Great answers, everybody. Our next question came in through LinkedIn from the Gender Equality Coalition of Ontario. Publicly funded childcare can support economic growth by increasing the participation of women in the labor force and expanding the tax base. Childcare is not an expense, but an investment toward a more gender balanced, resilient economy. What is your party's stance on a national childcare plan? We'll start with Karen Vecchio, Conservative Party of Canada. 
Thanks very much for this question. And from 2015 to 2017, this was one of my key roles that I was working on, was looking at the needs of childcare throughout Canada. Specifically in Elgin Middlesex London, we need to recognize the width of it. We need to understand the geography of it. We need to understand that if you're in Sparta, Ontario, driving 25 minutes to place your child into a daycare centre may not be the be best use of time or the best options for your family. We are saying that we will put forward a program that will allow you to deduct up to 75%, making sure that 75% that of your costs are deductible on your income taxes, and that would be refundable. We will continue to work with the provinces and territories to ensure that those who are most vulnerable and those in need in the lower income brackets will continue to have the spaces that are needed. But I believe that we need to have something that is flexible and works for Canadians, whether you're in downtown Toronto or whether you're in Sparta, Ontario. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Same question. Amanda Stark, Green Party of Canada. I'm just going to look, I'm going to address my notes here. Uh, we will restore and revamp the 2005 agreement reached between the federal government, provinces, and territories to achieve a universal access child care program in Canada. Again, I'll have to say a guaranteed livable income would address child care needs uh, first and foremost. Especially ensure, specifically ensure that Canada's universal child care program provides a workplace child care spaces wherever possible. Accelerate the creation of workplace child care spaces through a direct tax credit to employers of $1,500 uh, per child per year, and this is again an older platform I'm addressing, so it would need to be addressing the uh, the a livable income at the time, and the values and decisions of parents who choose to stay home with children. We would value the decision of parents who choose to stay home with children and support those decisions. Thank you. Thanks, Amanda. And finally, Afiz Ajibou, Liberal Thank Party you. candidate. Thank you. There's obviously a direct relationship between uh, child care and you know, being able to enable people to take care of their children and participation in the economy and obviously in growth, and uh, particularly in getting out of the pandemic. So. Labor participation for me uh, sits, you know, right at the heart of bringing back growth uh, into healthy Middlesex. And if you check our party platform, we've talked about this: the $10 a day uh, provision for childcare across the country, just just to enable everyone get back to working and get back to you know building the economy on the back of all the other strong policies that we're introducing in, in growing out of this pandemic uh, strongly. So uh, it's very clear there's only one party that is bringing all that to the table. Uh, at this point in time, including all the other policies around, uh, if you check some of the pandemic, uh, you know, the responses that we issued out, you know, within the pandemic, including all those payments that we got when the whole world shut down, right? These were just built to get us, you know, working. So for me, uh, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> thank you. You, heard, you guys are getting a lot yeah. into one minute, so thank you for that. <laughs> All right, next question. We will start with Amanda, and here's your question. It relates to proportional representation. No party with 39% of the vote should get 100% of the power, in the opinion of our questioner, who is a Facebook commenter. We've heard promises about proportional representation for 100 years. What is your personal thought on this issue, and what is your party's position? So Amanda Stark, Green Party. My personal position is that we need it. We need proportional representation, and it is my party's platform as well um, that that be instituted. And uh, what that looks like, I haven't seen details for, but I know here in London, when I lived here, we had ranked ballot voting for the first time, and, and it was very effective. I know in our party, we also used ranked ballot voting, which is a more democratic way uh, to, to, for everybody to have their say. So whether your first choice is chosen, uh, you cross that off. If you don't get 50% plus one, you go to the next one. And then if that one doesn't get 50% plus one, you go to the next one. It just, it gives more people more opportunity to have a say instead of just one name on a ballot. So that's what I think needs to be implemented and that's what our party believes as well. That would be uh, electoral reform would be the better way to go right now. Thanks, Amanda. Thank now, Afiz Ajibowu, Liberal Party candidate. So the Liberal Party is uh, fully committed to reforms, so electoral reforms, and that obviously also includes uh, proportional representation. Uh, I know that promise, uh, you know, sat right, you know, within the top three or so uh, into the last election, but we're just over two years outside the last election, 
And it was only a few months after that that we, we went into this pandemic. 18 months ago, like I said, the whole world shut down. So, and then some other priorities, including basic survival, you know, kicked in. And if you ask me, uh, judging from the top five priorities uh, that we have uh, in, in this election, I think we do have some of the strongest promises in lifting us out of this pandemic. We have some of the stronger promises in providing affordable uh, you know, housing for Canadians. We have some of the stronger uh, you know, policies in, in getting us to near zero uh, you know, greenhouse emission by 2050. And I think those are the clear priorities that Canadians want to talk about at this point. And obviously, when you, you, know, when you elect a, a very strong uh, parliament uh, behind one party, it's a lot easier to implement policies uh, you know, in that party. Thank you. And finally, Karen Vecchio, Conservative Party of Canada. Thanks very much. And I'm actually going to just build off of Afiz's uh, comment about majority versus minority. In the last 18 months prior to this election being called, we were in a minority government where we actually did get work done, where we had come together as opposition parties to ensure that good legislation was being passed, that good questions were being asked, and holding this government to account. So I really think at the end of the day, it's about the accountability of the government. Proportional representation is something that in 2015, the federal government under, under Justin Trudeau promised to have um, a democratic reform. We know that after a lengthy time, I believe it was 18 months of being studied, that after the the uh, testimony that had come in, they decided to put that in the back, on the back burner and not move forward with it as it did not come into the best interest. But minority governments can work. Majority governments can work. But most, uh, most important is being accountable. And what we need is accountable parliamentarians. Thank you. Can Would I, you like a rebuttal to that, I, If you don't mind, for 10 seconds, please, if you don't 30 mind. 30 seconds. And I, I just want to, so if you take one of the biggest issues that we have today, obviously, is the greenhouse gas emission and the climate emergency. and you would need to have a strong government, a government that has a majority uh, you know, backing of uh, Canadians to implement some of the strong policies that we have. But the voting records of you know, the Conservatives uh, it does not give you confidence, including uh, you know, Karen, uh, you know, unfortunately, if I, if I will ask. Uh, something like Bill C-12, you, you, you voted virtually nay on every provision, so every debate on Bill C-12 in Parliament. And this just validates the reason why you need you know, a majority government uh, you know, standing behind uh, all your policies. I think that a rebuttal to that rebuttal is probably warranted, Karen. Thanks very much. And a majority government does not mean a bulldozer approach that we saw from 2015 to 19. What we need is people working together. Opposition parties can bring a good amount of information to those debates and should never just be put aside because they're not in the majority. Everybody deserves a voice, just not a majority government. Amanda, did you want to rebut at no, all? No, thanks. All right, so <laughs> all the rebuttals for that question are done. Moving on, we have a question from our venue host regarding the survival of arts presentation with limited audiences. This just isn't economically feasible with most of the presentations that we do. The cost of production and artist fees don't make it possible to even break, to break even in these scenarios. Will each party find a way to support the arts? presentation in particular, and artists, if audience restrictions continue. Now, I believe we are starting with Amanda. I'm mixed up now. Amanda, start Green Party. <laughs> we'll go with that. Um, I'm not finding my page again, which is fine. I just know that my government or our, uh, sorry, our party sup uh, supports small businesses, including the arts. And I personally uh, have grown up in the arts, in the world of the arts. I come to this theater all the time. And, and I do think it's important to, uh, to prioritize these spaces in our communities. This is what keeps us going through all of the tough times. Uh, and uh, so our party would support um, financially small businesses, uh, working creatively. I mean, that's what this is all about, being creative. And so let's work creatively to get everybody what they need and uh, in promoting the arts in the community. Thank you. Thanks, Amanda. And I apologize if I, if I mixed that order up because I think I might have. So Afiz Ajibowu from the Liberal Party, same so, question regarding the arts recovery. Thank you. I am very passionate about uh, the arts uh, community, particularly performance arts. I do sit in theaters uh, 
regularly, uh, at least once or, or a couple of times every month. So for me, I, I will I definitely commit uh, to sitting down with all stakeholders uh, locally uh, within the riding and understanding what the touch points are, what the core issues are uh, out of this pandemic. Uh, it's a huge community. Uh, uh, you know, companies travel, you know, all over cities uh, performing and they do support so many jobs and you want to be in a position to, to work, uh, you know, with the operators in the industry, including venues, of course. But, you know, behind them you have all the companies, you have performance, you have uh, lighting companies, you have sound companies and all that, who all depend, uh, you know, on, on these venues continuing to stay afloat. So I will commit to working closely, uh, strongly uh, with operators in the industry to ensure that everyone stays afloat, uh, strong and, and performing uh, as long as uh, there's any other restriction that we haven't seen in this pandemic. Thank you. Thanks very much, Afiz. And Karen Vecchio, Conservative Party. Thanks very much. And we know that COVID-19 has really taken a bite out of the, ho of the hospitality sector, out of the tourism sector, and out of the arts and culture sector. We know that this has happened. We are going to continue to focus and ensure that we have supports and solutions to work with the hardest hit industries, including those. I look at my own communities and, and think of Port Stanley, Ontario, where they have the Port Stanley Festival Theatre. Last year, they were not open to the public. This year, they're at a reduced capacity. But just a few years ago, they expanded this beautiful theater that brings in so many people to the village of Port Stanley, where people will come out for dinner, they'll go for a stroll on the beach, they'll go for an ice cream cone, and they'll also see the theater. This is what keeps our community strong, and we need to make sure that we're there for these industries. I will put that personal touch on that and continue to work with the amazing theaters that are in our own communities and ensuring that their voices are heard. Thanks, great questions, everybody. Okay, I mean, sorry, great answers to the question, everybody. And now we have another great question, which came in from one of our municipal councillors. Partisan politics doesn't always align with community needs or concerns. And your job won't be just to represent your party, but all the constituents in your riding. It could at times also put you at odds with other elected representatives at the municipal level. How will you balance your community priorities over your parties? And we will start with Afiz Ajbowu, Liberal Party candidate. Thank you. So uh, I said this right at the beginning of my campaign that uh, I'm seeking to represent uh, the Elgin Middlesex London riding uh, in the parliament, not the other way around, not represent the parliament, or sorry, the party in the riding. And I'm saying that from the standpoint of two things. You need someone who has, who has the strength, the passion, and obviously the capacity and the energy to, to represent you and to articulate all the issues, whether it's on mental health, whether it's on housing, whether it's on uh, any other thing, including recovery after the pandemic or rural transit or enabling the economy generally, or even looking at, at the issue of farmers and, and things around uh, right to repair and those other issues that farmers have presented to me. My job will be to listen clearly to those things and take them to the parliament. Some of them will be uncomfortable to speak to at the center but I'm not going to waste any time in thinking I want to, you know, please people at the centre because it doesn't align uh, totally with the views of the party. My job as an MP will be to represent us in the parliament, and I'm happy to do that if you do give me your vote in this election. Thank you. Thanks, Sophie's. Next, Karen Vecchio, Conservative Party. Thanks very much, and I think my record speaks for itself when it comes to collaboration. Uh, back in May of 2000, or 2020, the London Abuse Women's Centre brought to my attention that funding was being cut under the MAPI program. It was Measures Against Prostitution Initiative. This was being cut under the Liberal government, and we couldn't get a hold of anyone. Collaborating with the NDP, the Green Party, myself, and the Bloc, all four po opposition parties came out to speak to the government on this. This was taking in a local issue that was so important, recognizing that sexual exploitation and human trafficking is a problem here in, in London, is a problem in Elgin County, and I wanted to ensure that those voices were being heard. We got that done. We had a presser. We did everything that we possibly could, and the next, the next uh, role that was done was the federal government having to step to the plate, but that was after working together. That is the type of passion that I have for my community and the people that live in my community. We don't always have to agree, but at the end of the day, we have to figure out what is best for the constituents that we all represent, and that is what I will always guarantee to do. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. And finally, Amanda Stark from the Green Party. Thank you. I am. Uh, I have a few points here for my own personal platform that talk about advocacy, accessibility, accountability, and action. And like Karen said, part of our job as representing the public is to uh, to bring forward concerns. Um, but also to hold the government accountable. So if that means I'm representing concerns that are maybe different than 
my personal view on things, I would have to be held accountable in that case, and I'm okay with that. And so uh, as a representative, I like to also see both sides and uh, see if we can find uh, a middle ground somewhere to make everybody happy, and you're not gonna always make everybody happy, but to do your best to, uh, to make sure that most people's needs are being met in the situation. And I do pride myself on being a community, community connector in that way. And if elected, that's what I would be for Elgin Middlesex London. Thanks so much. All of those responses, great again. Next question. We had a mental health crisis before COVID. We have a much bigger mental health crisis now. More money can't be the only answer. Something systemic has to change. What can be done by our government? First, we'll ask Karen Vecchio from the Conservative Party. Thanks very much. And I think for many families, for many individuals, this is probably one of the most important issues that we're talking about in this federal election. Mental health has touched every family through, through COVID-19. And as you indicated, it did occur beforehand. We need to make sure that we're working on best practices, working with our groups on the ground that are meeting those people in the places that they are. Sometimes it's addictions, sometimes it's mental health, sometimes it's homelessness, and it's a very complex issue. But by working with stakeholders on the ground and to make sure that all levels of our government are working towards a solution to help people, that is what we need to do. We have indicated that it, uh, through our transfers from the government that we'll, there will be an increase of 6%, uh, a minimum of 6% going with GDP to ensure that there is that money to help with mental health. We have also indicated that we'll invest to make sure that in the next number of years that there will be over a 1,000 beds to help with rehabilitation and 50 centers across this country to help with addictions. That is the type of work that we need to do in partnership. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Same question. Amanda Stark, Green Party of Canada. Thank you. Um, I think a lot of this has to do with priorities. And uh, the question said, we can't just keep throwing money at things. Well, um, I think that's, that's an important point, but also how are we spending the money? Are we holding people accountable? Are we getting it to the right places? Are we listening to the people who need it? And systemically is the issue. So it's the system that needs to change. So whether that's um, addressing uh, our drug use issues and so, Homelessness is a part of it, but also like not all our homeless are drug users. Not all our drug users are homeless, but that's a systemic issue. So scientifically, we need to come at this with a plan and that's uh, supported. Um, so we have a de decriminalization uh, plan. We also have um, supports in place. And um, in terms of the... Um, Mental health issues, uh, we do also have, we think it's a system that needs to be changed. Thanks, Amanda. And finally, Afiz Ajibo, Liberal Party. Th th thank you very much for, for that question. And, and in knocking doors across the riding, right, I, one thing has been I mean, recurring. For me, I think it's a shame on all of us uh, that in a G7 country, uh, for instance, and they are linked that one person, and, and I've driven around most downtowns, that you will see one person lying on the street, sleeping rough, and it could be, you know, due to just falling through the crack, uh, you know, jobs and all that, but it could also be due to, you know, mental health issues or, you know, just opioid uh, addiction. So for me, I think it's localizing the solutions and not thinking too much uh, through the central platforms, but just the MP just being grounded in working with everyone is a multi-agency solution, sitting with the, with the mayors, sitting with social services locally, checking what the opportunities are and creating solutions that will address, you know, for every town. So the solution for London might not be the same solution. Downtown London might not be the same solution for Elma or for, for St. Thomas, but the MP being the rallying point in creating those solutions. Thank you. Thanks for those responses. Again, we're getting close to the end of the debate. Here's an interesting one from me. One of the more frustrating things about some politicians present company accepted, is their extreme reluctance to admit that they are wrong. Tell me something you've been wrong about during your political career and how you made it right or how you intend to make it right. I'll give you a second to think about that one. And we'll start with Amanda Stark from the Green Party. Well, that's easy because my political career has been 
zero, um, but my personal record, I think, speaks for itself, and I do have lots of people who uh, would acknowledge they don't agree with me on different things, um, but in, uh, in our disagreements, we've been able to find common ground. I acknowledge my, posi uh, my position in, of error where, uh, wherever I need to, um, and sometimes I don't recognize that at first, um, sometimes I have to acknowledge that maybe I don't see things the way they did, but um, I can still acknowledge that in their perspective, uh, it was hurtful or it was the wrong choice. What can we do to make it better? I think that's a strength that I have is my empathy and my willingness to work together. So uh, if I was to make a mistake in politics, I would definitely own it. Thank you. Thanks, Amanda. Same question, Afiz Ajibowu, Liberal Party. Thank you. I, I think something I've learned in this last uh, one month uh, has been just understanding that purely we are, we are good people uh, at heart, right? Uh, as human beings, we're beautiful. And, you know, you will see all this toxicity and, you know, very lines, uh, you know, with people uh, campaigning against uh, choices, freedom, and all that. But we know what freedom is like. We, we, we have a beautiful country. We're beautiful, and we have a lovely country that is free and truly free and open. So for me, I, I've met people at the doors, and I've learned to just respect choices and opinions, and to also respect that the, the, the fact that we live in a truly democratic country gives us the option to have this, uh, you know, these choices and opinion. So, I mean, we're all at this stage with different views, uh, you know, policies and opinions and positions on, on how we can create solutions. But we're all here because we want to serve the people. So for me, that's one thing I've learned. We're good people and we just want to serve this community. So we should, I think, all condemn the, the toxic uh, things that we're seeing over the last uh, couple of days in our polity. Thank you. Thanks, Afiz. And finally, Karen Vecchio, Conservative Party. Well, I'm trying to think of the number of mistakes that I've made, and I'm sure they're numerous, but the one thing I find with myself, I'm not going to state specifically, but it's about the reflection. It's about that when the time that you take to learn about issues that are impacting people, that making sure that you're getting everybody's opinion. Uh, Joe Preston, who is the mayor of St. Thompson, was my former boss, I used to always say, that's one person's side, this person's side, and then there's always the truth. And I have taken those words of understanding, and also when it comes to myself individually as a person, reflecting on the words that I've used, reflecting on the decisions that I have made. And I think as a parent, uh, I don't know if there's any perfect parent out there, but I think that's where we learn our first mistakes, what we could have done better, what we should have done differently. And I take that entire way of, I, of of living my life and to my job, ensuring that people's voices are being heard. That is something that I continue to engage on and I believe at the beginning, like all new politicians, you, you, you do believe you have the right answer. But understanding that the best answer is when your answer works with everybody else's and you're finding some sort of solution, that is what is the best. Thanks. All right, thanks for those answers, everybody. I think we have one time for one more quick question. And this one is, was an election in the best interests of Canada at this time, in your personal opinion, or you can comment as a member of your party? We start with Afiz Ajibowu for the Liberal Party. Thank you, Brennan. I mean, you could argue that uh, this is not the best time for an election, but what we've seen uh, with a kind of uh, incursion into a polity, the dangerous incursion of uh, you know, this very toxic a version you know, of hate. Uh, we, we, we also saw what happened in London a few months back with a whole family wiped out. Uh, so what, what planted that hate in the, in the minds and hearts of that young man to have taken that vehicle and mowed down a family? And, and we're seeing that, people shouting and screaming, my freedom. I've, I've had encounters with people on this campaign, you know, screaming at me, you know, communists, get out of our country. This country belongs to all of us. You know, irrespective of where you come from. So for me, this just validates the reason why we should have this election at this time, for Canadians to speak strongly and elect a parliament that is truly representative of what we stand for as a people. This is not Canada. What we've seen over the last four days or the last two weeks is not Canada. The Canada we all want to see is post this election. Thank you. Thanks, Afiz. Karen Vecchio, Conservative Party. To begin, I believe what Afisa said is absolutely true. We, do, we should not be seeing what we've been seeing here in Canada because we are a beautiful country filled with beautiful people. 
Was this, country, uh, was this election necessary? 100% no. Same issue when it came to prorogation on August of 2020. Was it necessary? No. These are once again vanity projects. I look at the work that I was doing in 2020 and the status of women. We were talking about this she session as the Prime Minister wishes to call it. And when we came forward to provide an excellent report to him from all parties, he probed Parliament. We came back to a speech from the throne. So less than a year ago, we actually had a non-confidence vote choosing to continue forwarding with this government and supporting this government as we got through COVID-19. As we saw all of the things happening to us on August 15th, this Prime Minister made the choice and he made a choice to take us to the polls instead of getting through this country, through the, or getting this country through this crisis. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. And finally, Amanda Stark, Green Party. It's the opinion of both my party and myself that the answer is no. Thanks for that brief answer, because now we are all wrapping up and it's time for closing statements. So back to you again, Amanda Stark from the Green Party of Canada for your one minute closing statement. In closing, I'd like to thank Rogers for the opportunity to address the community today. I believe in democracy and all the messiness it entails, and I hope our constituents do as well. I think in such a time as this, when emotions are high and personalities are clashing, we need now more than ever to seek ways to work together. With my core values firmly rooted in environmental policy and social activism, I want to offer our area a new option outside of the scandals and corporate greed. We need a local member of parliament who is a unifying thread among constituents. Just like our 2019 slogan, we are not going left, not right, but forward together. We don't have a choice, to be honest. Climate change isn't going to wait for us to get our mess straightened out. With that in mind, I hope constituents will join me in voting for change this year. Vote Green. Vote Stark. Thanks so much, Amanda. Next, closing statements from Karen Vecchio of the Conservative Party. Thank you very much, and thank you to Rogers TV, thanks to the Aeolian Hall, and thank you to everybody who is watching today. It is very important that we have this opportunity to speak to constituents and to speak to people who want to know what they need in a Member of Parliament, what their communities need. The one thing that I am proud of is the work that I have done in Elgin Middlesex London. I have always been a team player working with the people of Elgin Middlesex London. When I talk about a team, it's the Elgin Middlesex London team. It is the team that comes together working in our municipalities and our provincial governments, working to make our communities a better place. It is the team that is going to work for this economy and ensuring that we can help with local businesses and ensure that we are providing the best opportunities for all Canadians and all Canadians alike. This is not the time for election, but it is a time to send a true representative a local representative from Elgin Middlesex London that is there for all of the reasons, not just single issues. It is important that we are there to talk about what Canadians need. We need a strong economy. We need a good health care system. We need a strong Canada. We need to secure the future. Vote Vecchio. Thanks, Karen. And finally, Afiz Ajibowu, Liberal Party candidate. Thank you, Bronan, uh, for the questions. And thank you, Karen and Amanda, for sharing this stage with you. Uh, what I've had, uh, you know, knocking doors, uh, whether in the south of London, whether in uh, St. Thomas, another parcel riding, is that the people want to see another representation in Ottawa, I mean, after 17 years of the Conservatives. And that's built on three things. They want someone with a passion, local passion and connection locally. And you can check my records, uh, you know, online, what I've done locally since I came to this country. I've served on several committees with the city. I've served in soup kitchens and all that. And I won an award in this city, you know, for giving back strongly. But they also want someone who has the depth of experience, the knowledge, the capacity and the education to strongly represent us in the parliament. I do have a very strong background in the sciences. I spent over 25 years in, in businesses, including 10 years in the boardroom of uh, global companies, managing over $1 billion uh, of top line numbers and supervising you know, a very large number of uh, teams. So I think I do have the capacity. I have the background, I have the experience, I have the education and I have the passion to represent us in the parliament. I think you should vote for me. Thank you. Thank you, Afiz. Thank you, Karen. And thank you, Amanda, for coming to our debate today. That's our show. Thank you very much to the Aeolian Hall and Clark Bryan for putting on this debate and helping our neighbors make informed choices on September 20th. On that day, we encourage you to vote and also tune in to Rogers TV's live coverage of the results as they come in, which will start at 9.30 p.m. Thank you so much for tuning in today, and we'll see you on September 20th. Thank you.